Welcome back to Advent of Code. Today is day five. So we've done successfully four days. We've done part one and part two for all four days so far. And we're starting to get a nice little ASCII art something over here. Problem five just unlocked. So let's click in and check out to see what it is. Supply stocks. The expedition can depart as soon as the file supplies have been unloaded from the ships. Supplies are stored in stacks of marked crates. Crates need to be rearranged. Ship has a giant cargo train. C train? <laughs> giant cargo crane. To ensure none of the crates get crushed or fall over, the crane operator will rearrange them in a series of carefully planned steps. The elves don't want to interrupt the crane operator. That, you know, I wouldn't want to interrupt a crane operator either. But they forgot to ask her which crate will end up where. And they want to be ready to unload them as soon as possible so they can embark. They do, however, have a drawing of the starting stacks of crates and the rearrangement procedure, or puzzle input. In this example, there are three stacks of crates. Stack one contains two crates. Crate Z is on the bottom and crate N is on the top. Stack two contains three crates from bottom to top, M, C, D. Finally, stack three contains a single crate P. Then the rearrangement procedure is given in each of the step of the procedure, a quantity of crates is moved from one stack to a different stack. In the first step of the above rearrangement procedure, one crate is moved from stack two to one, resulting in this configuration. So D is moved from two to one. In the second step, three crates are moved from stack one to stack three. Crates are moved one at a time, so the first crate to be moved, D, ends up below the second and third crates. So we've got D and Z, which reverses and then gets inserted into three. Then both crates are moved from stack two to stack one. Again, because crates are moved one at a time, C ends up below M. So we've got MC here and we got CM in the result. Finally, one crate is moved from stack one to stack two. So M goes from one to two. The elves just need to know which crate will end up on the top of each stack. In this example, the top crates are C in stack one, M in stack two, and Z in stack three. So C, M, Z. You should combine these together and, and give the elves the message C, M, Z. After the rearrangement procedure completes, which crates end up on the top of the stack? Woo, okay, so this is probably the toughest input that we've gotten so far, if we wanna parse this in. Let's take a look at the input and make sure that the input that we're given is fully ordered. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine from left to right, which is great for us. So interesting, interesting. How are we gonna do this? It does look like everything is spaced appropriately. So we could do a parser that is either three spaces or a letter. We don't know how deep these are. I wonder if we could chomp it all in a sequence. So I've got two ideas in my head. One is that we just chomp this in the regular order. So we go, we write a parser that can either uh, grab three spaces or a character, and we just run it on each line all the way down to the bottom. What we'll end up with then is an array for the top, an array for the second, an array for the third. But the way that I actually want to work with this, I think, is using a vec. So push will push onto the end. In this case, if we pushed D onto one, it would go N, Z, D. And pop works the same way. So if we have a vec here, we push one, we push two, it's got a length of two. We pop one, we get the end, so we get two. So push and pop would work for us. And I think that's what we'll do. So I think our move is to write a parser that just grabs each of these lines horizontally. And then we reorder those into different vex based on the number that we have or the number of them that we have. And then we also write a parser for these moves. So we need to uh, move some number of crates from one of the arrays to another. So this could be an array of arrays or a vec of vex more specifically. And then if we set it up like that, if we set up our data structures correctly, then it's just a pop one from two, push onto one, pop three from one, push onto three, which I like. Of course, we have to make sure that all the spaces are actually in the input if we do this. So yes. Okay. This is fully filled out with spaces. So that'll work for us. So let me go over here. We'll drop this in. Did I miss copy that? Yes, I missed copied that. That was an interesting note though. There was some extra space. So we've got D, we've got NC, and we've got ZMP. And NC are supposed to be first, which is great. And ZMP are supposed to be third, which is great. All right, so I think we're good. I think this is the correct input, at least. We really need to make sure these spaces stay here though, and that they don't get turned into anything. Okay, so what is our test result? Our test result is CMZ. 
So let's put that here. I copied this from our last day. So let me just clean this up a little bit. We'll ignore this second test for now. Um, we are going to write a non parser. So I'm going to rename this to stacks, I guess. And then I think we're good. Okay, so we have a failing test. Uh, we are not parsing it correctly because our parser is still the parser from day four. So we are going to parse this into a vec of vex, I believe. We're going to start by writing a parser for one of these cells, and then we're going to build that up into a parser for the entire line, and that should be good. Let's name a parser crate. Crate will have a U32 result. Oh, I can't name this crate because <laughs> crate is a keyword. Uh, what should we name this? Um, we're going to name this in here C, and I'll name the function something else. What do we name the function? We name the function, uh, let's call this parse crate. <laughs> So crate, crate is the name of a compilation unit for a piece of code in Rust, which is why it's a keyword. And this is going to return an option U32 because we could have a crate or we could have an empty space. And we're going to fill them all out either way. I'm going to go check into the nom docs. And what I'm looking for here is, I believe there's an option parser, but I don't remember what it's called. So I have to find it in the module. So actually there is a please refer to the choosing a combinator guide. So we could go to the choosing a combinator guide and this has some nice explanations for things. So you can see car is not one of tag is what I'm using right now for the spaces, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Alt I think is the, what I wanted. It's either going to be the tag of three spaces or it's going to be the actual crate parser. So I think alt is what I'm going to use. And then I'll also use delimited. I think because delimited will let me put a character in front, the parser I want, and then a character behind. So that'll be the crate parser. So if we go into parse crate, we need alt. And I think alt takes a tuple. Alt does take a tuple. You can see the extra paren there. I think the two parsers have to return the same result. So this might not be a time for a U32. So it'll be tag three spaces or limited car. I think it was open square bracket. And then I think alpha one is what I'm going with for the moment. And then we'll figure out if that's right in a second. We do have to bring all of these into scope because we haven't brought them into scope yet. I think this is going to be complete car. Yeah, it'll be complete car for us. This is, I'm using the full module path or at least a partial module path to differentiate it from the car type in Rust. So now we've got a number of parsers for pulling in alpha numeric values or alpha values. So we've got capital letters here for all of the test input. Our full input actually also does use capital letters. So we get to use alpha one. So this will recognize lower or uppercase, but we don't have really have to worry about that. So alpha one is what I wanted here. Nom character complete alpha one. So here we should get either an empty space or an alpha one. Our first parser to match is a three spaces. One, two, three. Our second parser that match is a delimited so open square bracket, an alpha character, so lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z, and then a closing square bracket. And we pass the input to that. We handle the error with question mark. We get back a string slice here, which we can then choose to match on. <laughs> so this is an option. This is not an option U32. I don't know why I thought it was going to be that. It's an option string slice. So we're doing our parser right here. We get back the rest of the input as well as the value that's returned. If we match on the value that's returned, we can check to see if it is in fact the first one or otherwise it will be the second one, which we store in result and we return. We're wrapping these in none or some so that we can easily deal with them later. So this will parse us a crate and then each line is going to be either a set of crates or a set of empty spaces. So we're probably going to use this separated list approach. So the separated list will be a tag of a single space and parse crate, at which point we'll pull this into a vec of options. So this we can call, uh, we can call this result. This won't be range inclusives anymore. That was the last day. This will now be a vec of option string slices, which we can return. And then of course our stacks will be a separated list one of new lines followed by lines. So that's fine. That's just not the type that we uh, are supposed to be returning. So we get a vec of vec of options of string slices here. <laughs> so if we were to return it right now, this is what we would have. And if we debug assignments, we should see that vec, that horizontal 
uh, vec. So nun D nun, N C nun, Z M P. And if we look at our test input here, we get nun D nun, N C nun, Z M P. So that's the right parsing. We then also need to like ignore <laughs> the next two lines. These IDs don't matter to us because we already have the positions. We do need to rejigger these crates, but we should deal with the parsing of these probably first. So this is going to be crates horizontal and the parser will just be crates. And then we'll have another function here. Probably can be everything else pretty simply, or we could just stick everything in here, which is fine too. Um, let's just keep doing it here. So if we do have the crates horizontal here, then there's other combinators that we can use such as take until. So we could also do terminated here instead of take until it might be a better option for us. And then we get to use the parser that I wanted. So here we get to use terminated instead, and then we will go for any character until we get a line ending. But we can debug the input and the numbers here to make sure that what we're getting is what we expect. And if I scroll down, ooh, it was any car, not what I thought it was. <laughs> I'm just tripping up all over the place today. Matches one byte as a character. Okay, that's what I thought it was. We don't want alphanumeric. We really do want any character because we have to match alphanumeric and spaces. This is what I get for trying to avoid parsing the line. <laughs> Ooh, so actually what I did was I didn't realize that what we had to do here was let input throw away equals new line because the separated list only puts a new line between the lines that we parsed. So there's still a new line there. And this isn't one any car, this is many one any car. Oh, and there are more spaces here than I thought there were. Of course there are. <laughs> Ugh, this is just not my not my day. Multi-space one. Let's go with that. All right. <laughs> that was ugly. Um, so we've got numbers one, two, three now. The parser that we've written here, there's a new line after our crates because it doesn't parse the new line on the end of the crates. So we throw that away, which gives us the line with the numbers on it. Uh, we are parsing any number of spaces before a digit a bunch of times. That's what this reads as. So we do end up getting our numbers as a vec if we want them. We don't, <laughs> but if we did, so we can do a throwaway here which is like input underscore equals multi-space input, and then let input underscore equals new line input. And we'll just do this twice to keep it simple. Oh, multi-space one, there we go. Has to be at least one space for that parser to succeed. So now that gives us the rest of the input, move one to whatever, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna do a move create function with a string slice. That's gonna return us a I result with a string slice. And this is going to be, I don't know, let's make a new struct called move. So right above this, I'll do struct move. Number is gonna be like a U32. From is gonna be a U32. And two is gonna be a U32. We could also do this as a three element tuple, but I will forget which one is which if we do a three element tuple. So here what we want is let input underscore equals tag move with a space, pass the input, let input number, equals uh, complete U32 is what we used last time. Complete U32 input, handle the error, let input throw it away, equals tag space from space, pass the input, let input from equals complete <laughs> U32, let input throw it away, equals tag space to space, input, handle the error, throw it, throw it away, and then let, <laughs> let Input two equals complete U32 on the input, handle the error. And this is gonna be a crate move line. So we'll return, okay, input move number from two, because we can just construct a struct like that. Uh, this is a complete colon colon U32. I don't know what I'm doing here. This is a weird error. Okay, complete U32 there, because I made a typo. Um, I'm gonna derive the bug on this because it'll make it easier to print stuff out if we ever want to. So we made a parser that is move crate. We are using tag to get any of these, like we have to do move space and then a number, space from space and then a number, space to spit and then a number. And that's all this is doing. Move from and then a number, space from space and then a number, 
space two space and then a number and then we're returning move and we call that move crate so let's do let input moves equals separated list one uh, new line move crate pass the input handle the error and then we should be able to debug moves here and just get the list of moves called result unwrap on an error value error input move one from two to one new line so we could be super lazy here if we wanted to <laughs> and do uh, some debugs. This isn't necessarily the best way to debug this. Um, there are ways to get the error values out, but I am looking to move forward more than I'm looking to set up error handling. So we get to here three and then we fail. So let's log out the input here. And the input is move one from two to one at here three. Is that because we're failing later? No, it's not. Um, why did I think we needed new lines here? I don't know why I put new lines there. Sorry, that's my bad. <laughs> I don't know, I parsed the wrong thing. I'm gonna put the underscore on these numbers. So now what we got here is all of the crates in the horizontal format. So we've got a separated list, new line, line for all the crate inputs. Then there's a new line. Then we get all the numbers, which is a bunch of digits preceded by a space. Then there's some space left on the end of the line. So we just kind of get rid of that. Multi-space one eats the new line, which is not something I was expecting it to do. So if you look at multi-space, it uh, recognizes zero or more spaces, tabs, and carriage returns and line feeds. So multi-space, not the parser that I thought it was. I should have read the docs. Um, space is what I thought it was, not multi-space, because space only does spaces and tabs. But multi-space will capture new lines as well. Uh, in this case, it doesn't care, matter that we're doing that here but i want to change that here now for the digits because that's not what i intended this to do so i'm going to choose the parser that is what i intended to do not the one that accidentally works okay so we got the moves that we need to take in the order that we need to take them we still need to set up the crates so let's do uh let well let mute crates equals or let mute crates vertical equals a vec this is going to be a vec of vex for underscore in crates or in uh, zero dot dot crates horizontal dot length. We can do crates vertical dot push vec. So we're just creating a bunch of vex here. We can specify the type as well. So this is going to be a vec of vec of something. In our case, it's going to be a vec of vec of, I guess these will be the option string slice that we parsed out earlier. So we're creating this vex here using classic for loops on a range zero to length of the number of crates that we have because I don't feel like counting. <laughs> and then we push a vec onto each of them, which means here we have the vex. Um, I guess we could fold here as well, but we haven't done for loops yet. So let's do for loops. We're gonna do index vec, I think. We're gonna iter.enumerate to get the index. And we're gonna do Creates vertical i dot push something that we don't have yet. So we need to do vec dot iter for for c in. Uh, I don't like that we can't use the word create. For c in vec dot iter creates vertical i dot push uh, c. I think c is a string slice, right? It's an option string slice or a reference to an option string slice. So here we go. We get the reference to an option string slice. We can clone the option with the string slice inside of it which gives us a vec of options of string slices. So we have all of our crates now. What we don't have is all of the options for moved. So none, sum, is this, no, this is horizontal, vertical. None, D, none, N, C, space. Are these right? I feel like these are not right. I think I messed this up. This is what happens when I use indexes. <laughs> uh, so for I and crates horizontal, dot iter dot enumerate. I don't think that's what we want because we're iterating from the top to the bottom here. So if we reverse this, we go from bottom to top, which means we start at the zero index. If we don't need the enumerate here, I don't think. Yeah, we don't need the enumerate here at all, actually, because we don't need this index. So we just get the vec and then here we can enumerate, which will tell us which vec to put it in. So we get I, C, and that should give us the vertical. Z, N, none, M, C, D, and P. Let's see, Z, N, M, C, D, P. That looks right to me. 
So now all that's left is to filter out all of the nuns from those. <laughs> this is a lot of for loops. So I want to filter none here. If we go to the iterator docs, filter map is what we want here. Yeah, because it returns an option here. So this is going to make it really easy for us. So filter map allows us to filter and return an option to determine whether to keep the item in the VEC or not. So if we filter map and we have our value here, which is an option type. So this, let's save that. Um, so what we get here is a VEC of option strings that we can iterate over, that we can filter. So the filter takes a V as an argument in this closure, which is an option string. All we need to do is dereference this to get to the option because we can't pass the uh, reference to the option back. This collects into final crates. And instead of using TurboFish, let's do uh, vec vec of string slice. And why do I feel an ownership issue coming along? <laughs> Value of type vec vec string slice cannot be built from iterator filter map option string slice. So what did I do wrong? We have our vertical crates. The vertical crates is a vec of vec of options of string slices. We are iterating over that, which gives us an iterator over a vec of options of strings. We're mapping over that, which gives us a reference to the vec of option of string slice. We iterate over that vec to filter map it. That gives us the value of a reference to an option to a string slice, uh, which we have to dereference, which I am not collecting. Ha <laughs> ha, that's the issue. So remember, anytime you start an iterator, you have to have a function on the end that finalizes the iterator and turns it into something, uses it, right? Because iterators in Rust are lazy. And if you don't call collect or sum or something that finalizes the iterator, it will never actually run. Final crates is a vec of vec of strings. So it's our crate stack. We don't want crates horizontal anymore. We want, let's do create final crates and moves. And this is not the return type that we have in a function yet. So we need to specify that it is. Remember moves is the separated list of moves that we have to operate on. So if I count those correctly, that is this. And then it's a vec of move. And that should be the right return type expected enum option found string. We don't have options in our return type for the crates anymore because we filtered those out. So we should be good now. This is no longer crates horizontal that we're debugging out here. This is crates and moves, which makes it more obvious that these are now crates or crate stacks and moves. Okay, so what do we need to do here? Let's destructure this, call this crate stacks and moves. We need to for m in moves dot iter. Let's do a destructure here just to show that we can number from two. So for move, which is a number of crates, we have to move it from some index to some index because we didn't keep the IDs. These are all the right indexes. I don't think we have like a pop three. So in VEC we have pop, right? But I don't think we have pop three. I know that we have take in the iterator. So we could do like iterator reverse take. We could also use something like splice. I don't know that that gains us much over popping. Drain, I think we'll drain the whole thing. We don't get to specify. Ooh, removes the specified range from the vector in bulk, returning all removed elements as an iterator. If the iterator is dropped before being fully consumed, it drops the remaining removed elements. Okay, so drain removes a range. If we can specify a range, then we're good. How do we specify the range? for the reverse. So I think we could drain. Let's play with drain for a second. Let's first make create stacks mutable because we'll need that. And let's do create stacks from dot drain. So we get the length of the stack that we care about. And then we do the length minus the number. I think we have to do plus one here because if we have, a, if a, if we have a, an array of five items, for example, and we wanna move three of them, then five minus three is going to be two, but we want to start at three and go up. So we want this and we want it to be an infinite uh, iter or an infinite range to the end. And then for this, so for create in, I can't, I can't use create, for C in this, I think we also want to reverse this. And then we want to do two dot push C. And we specified that these were U32s but indexes always have to be U size, so we can just specify them as U size. Um, they're all references, so we do have to get the actual values, and this has to be the actual value, so we dereference that. 
and then this has to be as u size as well. It probably would have been better for me to specify that these were u sizes. Uh, so now we've got an issue with mutable borrows. So we could collect this. It's not a big issue. And that would free up our borrow because basically what we're doing is we're borrowing from crate stacks as mutable. So we're taking items out of this VEC and then we're also trying to stick them into crate stacks. So I think I'll just collect and save myself the hassle. And I can just do this like that. So I don't even have to really change what I did. I just create the allocation. So we're draining crate stacks off into a new uh, VEC of string slices. We're doing it in reverse so that we get the right order. We're iterating over those, and then we're pushing them into the place that they need to be. Uh, it says the length is three, but the index is three. So is two, oh right, two is going to be the other ID. So two actually needs to be minus one. Interesting. Okay, so I think what I'm actually going to do here is when we do from and to, when we parse it, that's not where we're parsing it. <laughs> uh, from, where's from? There's move, here's from, and I'm gonna do from is from minus one. So that these are actually the indexes instead of the attempt to subtract with overflow. That's interesting. So from and two, I don't think we have any zeros. So from two to one, from one to three, did I leave a minus? in here no i did not length minus number at 101 so it is at this drain so let's debug length and number length three number one length two number three we still move three so let's debug number from two and we can debug crate stacks used after moved of course because we need to do this as a shared reference so that we can use it later on line 101 so let's take a look when we go through this we get crate stacks zn MCD and P, we need to move one from one to zero. So from MCD to ZN, the length, am I using the wrong crate here? Number from two. So crate stacks from as the index is MCD. MCD has three in it. We need to move one from that, but the iteration isn't happening. Okay. So do we ever get into here? Did I mess something up in here? I'm just going to capitalize move. And it doesn't look like we ever get into that. So I've done something wrong. Let's call this drained equals this. First collect, and then 4C in drained dot iter here. And that'll do the same thing, but it allows us to debug drained, which needs to be a shared reference while we're debugging it. And drained is an empty array, which is not good. So I messed up our drain logic is what I did. Let's see if I can log that number out. That number, <laughs> I hope that number isn't zero. <laughs> Well, if it is zero, it's fine. But length minus number as u size plus one equals three. Oh, now that we've changed those, is that required anymore? So assertion failed. We're getting into move now. Drained is showing up. So we should be able to get rid of this debug and this debug. We've got the crate stacks and what's being moved. So we've got ZN MCDP and we have to move D. D is now sitting on ZND. Then we drain DNZ. PDNZ is PDNZ the right PDNZ that is right so CM and PDNZ but this one is getting both of them for some reason so when we go to crate stacks here we've got MC in zero which is not where it is interesting interesting MC is in zero here or CM I guess CM is in zero here which is fine and then drained as M so is this all correct and I can stop debugging everything what we need to debug out here is the crate stacks, which is the very last debug. So we've got CM PDNZ. We've got CM PDNZ. So that is all correct. <laughs> so that was an adventure. A little bit more of an adventure than I expected it to be, honestly. And then the value that we need to return here is still the last value in each. So we could do a loop. So... So let mute uh, result equals string from empty string or alternatively create stacks dot iter dot map v. We can match v dot pop, fill the match arms. Either we get a C value, which is what we return, or we get nothing, in which case we get an empty string. We collect because we have to call collect on our iterators to finalize them. And this is result, which is going to be a string Pop requires, we don't actually want pop. We just want to look at the last one. So v.iter.last, uh, we'll do the same thing. And then we result to string and our test is passing. 
So part one is passing. Before we celebrate too much, let's go grab the input, which is significantly larger. And let's put it into input. And let's do cargo run bin part one. Index out of bounds. The length is eight, but the index is eight. No. Okay, so something else is wrong. That's not good. Hopefully it's early on. Let's do moves.iter.enumerate. And then for, we don't use the I here, yeah? So we use I here. We get our destructure and I'm just gonna debug I. And at least that will tell us which step we bail on. <laughs> Is it step zero? <laughs> oh no. Did I mess something up horribly? Oh, 84. Click on 84. Creates vertical I. Ooh, interesting. I hate working with indexes and for loops, honestly. I always make mistakes with the indexes. So index out of bounds, length eight, index eight. This is actually, is that dot dot equals? Let's make sure our test still runs. Our test still passes. So I think I just failed to account for the extra array. I don't, I don't know why that fixed it. I'm concerned now. I'm concerned now, people. I'm concerned this is not gonna be the right answer. That's the right answer. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, perils of doing this live and also recording and also trying to explain myself is that I get my own logic crossed over when I'm talking about it sometimes. So <laughs> who's ready to go over part one? Let's get the debug out first. So let's get rid of that debug. Let's get rid of this debug. This is quite a bit of logic. I was a little meandering on this one. Okay. So we've got these crates. They're given IDs. We totally throw the IDs away. And then we've got these moves. We wrote the parser. The parser should make sense, but we'll go over it quickly. And then we have to move some number of crates from one of these arrays or one of these vex into another one of these vex. And we have to do it in reverse order because we have to pop them off the top and move them as if we're actually lifting them. So the parser isn't too bad to do each crate, which is either going to be empty space like this, three spaces, or it's going to be a letter wrapped in square brackets. We write this parse crate function, which takes the input in a string slice and returns an option string slice. So the tag is space, 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 we turn into a none. And if it's delimited by square brackets and is an alpha, then we return some value. So we're returning an option depending on which one exists here. Uh, this The key point here is that the alt branch combinator exists, which will allow us to try this one and if it doesn't work, try this one and return whichever one succeeds. Then for each line, that's gonna be a separated list by spaces and parse crates. This gives us a vec of those crates. We then construct a custom struct called move with a number of crates to move, the array to move from, and the array to move to. These are indexes. We do that by using a couple of tags for move, from, and to, and in between them are U32s. So move one, from two, to one is a couple of tags for move from and to, and then integers between them. Now the IDs for these are not zero based indexes, they're one based indexes. So we subtract one to turn them into zero based indexes so that we just get to use them instead of doing the minus one every time we do the application of a move because we kind of threw away the IDs anyway. That's totally gonna bite us in part two, I can feel it. <laughs> so our parser then takes the input as a string slice and returns us the vec of vec of crates, as well as a vec of moves to apply to the crate stacks. First, we parse out the crates by using a separated list. We get the new lines in between them. We get each of the crates horizontally, which gives us the horizontal representation of the crates going from top to bottom. So we get something like none d none, nc none, zmp. Then we do some throwaway parsing. There's a new line here. There's the numbers here which are a bunch of numbers preceded by spaces. We use multispace one to just gobble up all the other space, including the new lines. And then we parse each of the moves using a new line and the move crate parser. We set up some for loops here because we haven't used for loops yet. So we set up a vec of vec of options, which is the options that we parsed out of the crates. We iterate over each of the crates horizontally and we push in some new vecs just so that we get the opportunity to push into those indexes later. And in the next for loop, we iterate over all of the horizontal vex we have and we enumerate. So from left to right, that will give us the index of the vec that we need to push into. 
So we do creates vertical into one of these vex and we push the character, which gives us the final set of crates. And finally, what we need to do here is we need to iterate over that final set of crates because we don't want an option of string slices. We wanna get rid of all the none values. So we iterate over the crates and we map each of the vex for each of the vertical stacks of crates. We iterate over those. Filter map is a filter function that takes a sum type or an option type as a return value. Because we already have an option type, we can just dereference the reference and pass back the option type, which will basically unpeel all of the options for us and discard all of the nuns. We collect that into a vec, collect that into our final crates. We get a vec of vec of the crates and we return final crates and moves as a tuple from our parser. So in process part one, we had to apply that parser to the input. We unwrap it because it could theoretically fail even though it doesn't. And then we get the crate stacks and the moves. I've made the crate stacks mutable because we're gonna mutate them. We're gonna iterate over all of the moves that we need to apply. This gives us the number of crates to move, where to move them from, and where to move them to. We get the length of the stack that we are moving from, and we use that length to calculate the starting position for the crate that we need to move that's the lowest on the stack. And then we use an infinite range. So a number dot dot is an infinite range from some number up until the end of the vec, and we drain it. Then we reverse that because drain gives us an iterator of those elements and we collect those into a vec. We collect those into a vec to avoid the problem of having to mutate crate stacks from multiple places in our program. This allows us to iterate over the drained values and just put them in the crate stacks at the appropriate index. All indexes in Rust are U sizes, so all of these values that we're getting from the move destructuring up here are references, which I can prove to you by showing you the type inlays. So these are all references to U32s for number from and to, because iter gives us references into the vec that we're iterating over. So we dereference to get the value, and then we convert to a U size because indexes into vecs have to be U sizes. And then we push those characters in, which gives us each of the moves applied to the stack of crates. After we've done all of the moves, what we need to do is get the last value for each of the stacks. So we iterate over it, we map over that, we match on the vec iter dot last. Dot last will give us an option type because if this is an empty iterator, we might not have anything. If there's nothing there, for some reason there's no crates in the stack, it's an empty string. If it's a value, then it's a letter and we wanna return the letter. We can collect that into a string because collect is super powerful and we can just collect it into a string. And then we actually don't need this to string. I just have it there as some boilerplate because result is already a string. So we just return it. And that's part one. <laughs> so my guess is that part two is going to say, hey, we're gonna mix up the IDs because we decided to get rid of them. <laughs> as you watch the crane operator expertly rearrange the crates, you notice the process isn't following your prediction. Wonderful. Some mud was covering the writing on the side of the crane, and you, quip, and you quickly wipe it away. The crane isn't a crate mover 9,000, it's a crate mover 9,001, which is over 9,000. Ah! The crate mover 9,001 is notable for many new and exciting features, air conditioning, leather seats, an extra cup holder, and the ability to pick up and move multiple crates at once. Again, considering the example above, the crates begin in the same configuration. Moving a single crate from stack two to stack one behaves the same as before. However, the action of multiple, however, the action of moving multiple, however, the action of moving three crates, if I can read, from stack one to stack three means that those three moved crates stay in the same order, resulting in the new configuration. Next, as both crates are moved from stack two to stack one, they retain their order as well. Okay, so we just don't reverse these. So MCD is the new order. Let's get that into our test. And we're just gonna copy and paste the code that we had for process part one into process part two because it's the same code. And then instead of reversing our drain, we're just not gonna reverse it. And then we need to enable our test. Uh, let's test first, <laughs> cargo test, test pass. Let's make sure that two tests are passing, two tests are passing. Cargo run bin part two. is the uh, answer. So we put that in, we submit it, and we get a gold star. So yeah we get a little bit more ASCII art here. So I'm really excited about the fact that we only need to remove one thing or change one little thing. It's happened for us two days in a row now, which, you know, it feels like we're writing some complicated code. Uh, it feels like we're writing a lot of code. I get that. There are some things here that I just wanna show off, 
There are things that I want to get us into so that we see them. I want to show you how to fix what happens when you have multiple mutable borrows and stuff like that. And we can't really get into those situations unless I complicate it a little bit. So I like that uh, draining these off. All we had to do was remove this reverse and it picks up the stack in the right order. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, as usual, post them in the comments and I will catch you tomorrow for the next video. In the meantime, I dropped another video. So if you watched all of this one, maybe go check out the other one I dropped today because it's awesome and I worked hard on it. So check it out. <laughs> Have a good rest of your day.